Corin, thank you for coming today. My pleasure. What we'd like you to do is start by telling us when you came to Redondo Beach and as much as you remember about those early years and all the way till today. Well, I first came to Redondo Beach, I should say Manhattan Beach, in 1935 when I was 11 years old. My family moved down here from Seattle, Washington. And uh, in those days, Redondo Beach or most of Manhattan were all like one. So I consider myself a part of Redondo Beach from that day forward. And uh, my father bought a house two blocks from the beach on 35th and Manhattan Avenue for $6,000, a great big house. <laughs> and he used to go down two blocks to catch a red car to go down to his uh, office at 6th and Spring in downtown L.A. He was a stockbroker down there. And as I was telling Dinah the other day, it's too bad they gave up that red car right away. That would have been an outstanding transportation system today. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to grade school? I went to grade school at Center Street School in Manhattan Beach. I think it's now a different name, Pacific or something like that. And I don't think any of the same buildings are still there, just like the high school. Mm -hmm. I think there's only one building that's left uh, from when the time I was there. And what, what year did you start grade school in Manhattan Beach? Uh, I was started in the seventh grade when I was 11 years old. And when you uh, eventually, well, as a young child at 11 years old, did you ever come to Redondo Beach? Oh, yeah. What did you come to Redondo Beach for? We used to come down here to go to Fox Theater and go to the Plunge and uh, all those good things down there. So what was the Fox Theater like? Oh, it was fabulous. It, uh, it was huge. I guess when you're a little kid, things seem bigger than they really are, but uh, it was a huge theater. What was the interior? It was the only theater, it was the only theater around at the time. We didn't have anything in Manhattan then. And or, where was it located? Uh, right on the ocean, right down. I guess it was about where, where the entry to Boat Basin 3 is now, as you come into the the main channel, somewhere in that area. So where there's water now today, Yes. it was out that yes. far? Yes, yes it was, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then they, at some point the harbor was built. Yes. And that's what we're talking about is in 2005. And they put so much concrete in that building, they had, they had a really bad time tearing it down. What was As the, I remember, it, the, it was a real effort to remove that building. So what was the inside of the theater like? Do you remember? Oh, it was really plush, very ornate and, uh, you know, something like Grauman's Chinese today. It was really elegant. It was just magnificent. And do you remember any of the movies that struck you that, when you, that you watched there in Redondo Beach? Oh, I remember the cowboy movies. I used to like those. <laughs> well, I don't remember any particular movie, no. When, uh, what year did you start high school at Redondo? Uh, 1937. And what was your freshman year like? What did you have a? Did you know what you wanted to do, and did you take a course of study, or did they? I didn't have a do? clue what I wanted to do at that age. But uh, all our Manhattan Beach friends, or all of my Manhattan Beach friends, went to the same high school. It was just one high school, and we all, all the people at the beach, went to the same school. Yeah, you mentioned the beach. What was? What has the beach meant to you since you moved? here to Manhattan Beach in Redondo Beach? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm just a beach rat at heart. I grew up on the beach uh, during the Depression when I guess everybody was really struggling. We went to the beach every day. We weren't even aware there was a Depression on when we were little kids. Mm -hmm. What did you do at the beach? Did you, was surfing a big thing? Oh, body surfing. We, we were all body surfers then. They had these huge paddle boards built on a, on a wood frame with plywood, and they were so heavy, it took about three people to carry them. They weren't like the light balsa wood or, or fiber boards today. So we soon lost interest in <laughs> carrying those big things to the beach. It was just too much of an effort, and so we were all body surfers, and all very good at it, by the way. So how did you build a body bodyboard? Did you do your own? No, we didn't use bodyboard, body just body surfing. So you body surfed just in the waves by yourself? Yes, yes, right. And what was the best place to body surf? Well, right below uh, all of Manhattan Beach was fantastic. 
Uh, we lived at 35th Street, right below there was good. Then in high school, we used to go down to 8th Street. That's where the gang sort of collected, and we'd go body surfing there. It was all good. And that was at 8th Street? in 8th Street in Manhattan, in Manhattan, yeah. Was there any place in Redondo Beach that you could body surf? Oh, sure. We just, you know, we our transportation wasn't that great. We had to ride on our bikes and all that sort of thing. In high school, we, when we had talked to you previously, they, you talked about the Georges. Can you tell me how the name came about and what, who they were? Well, it just sort of happened. In those days, George was a, 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 a positive thing, like, like cool is today. Like, that's cool. In those days, it, if something was great, that was George. So we had this group of five of us, and we decided we'd call ourselves the Georges. Uh, this was early on in high school, I think freshman or sophomore year. And four of us were from the same grammar school in Manhattan, and one was from Redon one was from Hermosa, yeah. And so uh, this was about 1931? Let me think a minute. No, that was when we first started high school around 1930, probably be about 38 that we first started that group. So the Georges, what did they wear? Well, we had a constitution where you had to wear certain clothes at certain times. And uh, during the week, we wore white T-shirts and Levi's with a cuff rolled up. And that was our everyday uniform that we wore all through high school. Of course, that wasn't that unique. That's what most people wore in those days. <laughs> but we had to because of our constitution. And when we'd go collectively to the basketball games or any event that we weren't playing in, we'd wear these wild plaid shirts and cowboy hats So what did the and go as a group. So what do the girls think of the Georges? Well, I don't really know. <laughs> we were kind of, in a way, an elite group, I guess because everybody played sports and was active in the school, so it... Uh, Did you play sports at Redondo? Yes, football and track. Mm -hmm. And what was the football team like, and what did you play when you, you played what year? Uh, I played tailback. I, I played in uh, 40, let's see, 40 and 39 as a uh, junior and senior. And where was the gym at that time? You said that there aren't very many buildings left. Today no, in it was. Uh, I think it was generally in the same location where the new gym is. Okay. Generally in that location, uh, there, the football field is still in the same place, and there was a baseball field between the gym and the uh, football field. So it's approximately the same place it is today. And what type of equipment did you use? What kind of equipment did Redondo have uh, in '39 and '40? Pretty much the same as today, except we had leather helmets, <laughs> and that goes back a while. And was Redondo a good team? They were average. I think we were five and four or something like that. I, the next year and the year after that is when they had their really good teams. So at 17 years old in 1939 and 1940, what would you do for fun with your friends in Redondo Beach? Uh, I was only 15 then. I wasn't 17. I was in, in college when I was 17. So in high school, though, what, what would you do for fun? Oh, we'd go to dances and uh, go to movies and have picnics and hay rides and that sort of thing. Where, where were the, the dances? At the, at the high school or were there some? Wherever. Uh, in fact, the Georges even put on a dance at the Los Angeles Athletic Club, which used to be down at about 14th Street in Hermosa Beach. It's a huge building. Uh, I think it later became a hotel, but then it was the Los Angeles Athletic Club, and uh, we the Georges put on a big dance there. And were you popular from that dance? <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> the dance was uh, four out of the five of us that were handling the dance. Unbeknown to us, they had to go to an evening track meet in Inglewood that night. We were running in the in the track meet, so one one person had to run the whole thing until we got there. <laughs> But it was a pretty successful dance, and uh, and uh, we just about broke even on it. And a lot of the high school people went there. Mm -hmm. 
You talked about hay rides. Where did you take, where were the hay rides? Uh, oh, I remember when I first came here in Manhattan Beach, they used to put some hay on a truck and get a bunch of kids on there and just drive around. Not, not like a wagon or anything, just a truck. What was the, what were the houses in terms of density like back then in 1939 and 1940? Do you remember? Yes, there were very few houses. I think the population was around 2,500 in Manhattan Beach in those days. You could walk from, uh, from our house on 35th Street to Center Street, which is now Manhattan Avenue, and see maybe a dozen houses. And how did you get to school in Redondo when you came to school in the morning? Uh, we'd ride our bikes or take the bus. We've heard stories before about what streets were paved and not paved. What what street would you take from Manhattan Beach to Redondo to get here? Uh, most of the streets at the be beach were paved, as I remember. But then well, well, <laughs> once you got past the sand over the hill, we call that the back country. There was absolutely nothing there now. And so do you remember what, uh, did you ever go to North Redondo Beach for any reason to no. to look at anything? No. Uh, I wasn't really aware that North Redondo Beach existed in those days. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I was really aware of was the downtown and the high school. Can you tell us anything about the gambling ships in Redondo? Yes. Uh, they were quite popular in the days when they were within the three-mile limit. Uh, they had a great crowd go out there, and uh, then for some reason or other, they legislated the fact that they had to be 12 miles out, and the thing just sort of disintegrated after that. Did you ever get a chance to go out to the, the gambling ships? No, I didn't. I was just a kid. I don't think they even let kids on there in those days. My father went out quite often. He, he really enjoyed it. Did you ever see, how did they get out there? Did they go, was there a but, harbor in Redondo Beach at the time or? No, as I remember, they just uh, took a boat off the end of the pier. And that's the Mondstadt Pier? or the, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you remember about the plunge? Did you ever go to the plunge here in Redondo Beach? Quite often, yeah. We went there, oh, probably once a week. It was huge. It, uh, I was really impressed with the size. And did it have diving boards? Oh, or? yes, diving boards, all different heights, and uh, it, it was just a huge plunge. And how, do you remember how, was it warm or cold water? Warm water, warm water, and it was always crowded. There were always a lot of people there. And did you ever, uh, you competed in football and in track. in track. Did you ever do anything in swimming? No, never did. Was there anything else around the plunge that, where you spent time besides the Fox Theater? or Well, I remember there were several uh, restaurants and so on. I remember the Wagon Wheel was there. That's the only one I remember the name. There were several ref restaurants and uh, entertainment, kind of a Coney Island type atmosphere. What was the Wagon Wheel like? And what kind of food did they serve? Uh, I wasn't a connoisseur of restaurants in those days. I don't think I could offer anything on that. Um, you mentioned what years did you graduate from high school? Uh, 1941. So what was the beginning of World War II like for you here in Redondo Beach? What, what did you experience here? Well, the first thing that we experienced were the blackouts where they just, every night, they, they blacked everything out and the gas rationing, of course. We had the A tickets and so on where you could only get so much gas and so on. Do you remember the night that, uh, recently I went to Manzanar and at Manzanar they had a uh, the front page of, I think it was the LA Times and it talked about Japanese planes over Redondo, over Redondo, Long Beach. And I remember that very well. Because we were blacked out at the time, and I had left my girlfriend's house in my father's car, and we weren't even supposed to be on the road while I was driving all the way home in the dark. But I remember all the, all the tracers. They, I don't think there were any planes. I, I, I really don't think there were any planes, but uh, they sure made a racket shooting at them. Do you remember things falling? Out of the sky, the no, shrapnel or no, anything like that? No, I, I, I didn't experience any of that. So you, were you driving home that night in the middle of it? Yes. And what did your dad say to you when he got home? Well, he was a little concerned. 
<laughs> my my dad was a pretty cool guy. He didn't he didn't chew me out or anything. Um, at some point, did you join the military? Yes, the day I was supposed to sign up for the draft, when on my 18th birthday, I joined the Navy. And what did you do there? Oh, I ended up as a uh, combat intelligence officer. Did you? Where did you serve your uh, your stay as a combat officer? Well, I I was I was a combat intelligence officer. I ended up as an instructor of all things on on uh, San Clemente Island. But most of my time was spent in the states going to college mm -hmm. and learning. Uh, I went to about five different universities. One of the in the pre-interview, you mentioned that you took some friends, Japanese friends, to the internment camps, uh, or that. No, I had some good friends that, that we played football with that were Japanese, and they were taken to internment camp. I didn't take them. Do you remember where they... I have no idea where they went. I just remember they disappeared. Mm -hmm. Did you we see had two or three Japanese players that played on the football team. For Neat we, guys. For Redondo? For Redondo, yes. When you came back from the war, did they come back to Redondo? Do you know? I never saw them again. Um, You've been to, uh, one of the things that you've been involved in is architecture at, yes. in Redondo Beach. You went to the military, came back, went to Stanford, got your degree. Mm -hmm. uh, we read in art. Yes. And then in ar uh, a degree in architecture. Well, Stanford didn't really have an architectural school at the time. So uh, I decided when I was in the Navy I wanted to be an architect. So I went there. I had gone there uh, for one quarter before. Uh, I went in the Navy, so I went back there, and uh, they had what they call a pre-architectural course where they had, you take some art courses and some engineering, and they had an, one architect uh, professor there, and he taught a few architectural courses, but they didn't give any degree in architecture. They didn't have an architectural department per se. So I actually, the only way I could get a degree was in art because it was handled through the art department. Mm -hmm. When the things I've heard is that you've built a lot of uh, different things in Redondo Beach. What year did you start as an architect in Redondo and what are some of your early projects and some of the other projects that you Well, had? I finished graduate school in 1954 and I worked in Boston for a while. And then I came out here and worked for other architects for a couple of years. Then I started my own business in 1957. And where did you have your first business? It was in Hollywood Riviera. And do you remember, I think the streets may even be different. No, it was 1848 South Alina. It's now a yoga place. <laughs> and what was it, what was Hollywood Riviera like in 1957 when you came back? Well, I remember this friend of ours, Bob Byrne, a realtor, was trying to sell us lots for $500, and we thought he was trying to rip us off. <laughs> and in a commercial area of, uh, of Hollywood Riviera, there were quite a few empty spaces. And what kind of businesses were there in 1957? Uh, mostly a lot of professionals, doctors and so on. In fact, the building that I moved in was all doctors, all medical. I just started with a very small office, and then as we expanded, I expanded in that same building. And what types of projects did you do in 1957? Did you design any of the houses in Redondo, or were you doing commercial properties? Uh, most of the houses I've designed have been in Palos Verdes. Uh, commercially, uh, well, early on, we did the Redondo Medical Clinic, well, the second floor of the Redondo Medical Clinic, which is now Healthcare Partners. That was in the late 50s or early 60s. And where is that? It's on uh, 500 block on Torrance Boulevard. At Camino Real? Or near Camino Real? Yes, just before you get there. Okay. It was an interesting project because we built this uh, upper floor over the lower floor, which was in existence. And uh, <laughs> they kept in operation while we were building it. Then, the nurses were walking around there, and all of a sudden there'd be a steel column coming through the roof. <laughs> it, uh, it, it it was a challenge to build that while while they had it in operation. And that's that building is still standing today. In yes, yeah, still standing today. It's Healthcare Partners. Yes, where I go for my doctor. Uh, you got married in 1957. Where, yes. Where did you meet your wife, and how did you meet her? 
Well, that's an interesting story. I had just come back from the East, and uh, I was out here. I was going to spend the whole summer looking for a job, and I called on most of the architects in L.A. just uh, just for the experience of doing that. And uh, she and her roommate were going up to buy some liquor for a party they were having. And my father just happened to be at the liquor store, and they ran into his car, and they thought they could get away, <laughs> and they scooted off. But the owner of the liquor store saw him, and he knew them, and he knew my father, so he told him where, the, where they were and who they were. And so he went down to, to collect some money to fix it. The dent was something like $17. And they lived on a strand, and he went down and knocked on the door, and uh, Joan came to the door. She wasn't the one that was driving, and he says, I'm looking for Faye Duke. And he, she said, well, she's not here. And they talked for a while, and uh, he said she was really something. And I guess she liked him, too. Anyway, uh, he said, say, I have a son I'd like you to meet. <laughs> and, she said, well, have him come on down. We're having a party tonight. That was the same liquor that they bought at the liquor store <laughs> where they had the wreck. So uh, I went down to the party and took my radio and a, a bottle of really good scotch. And I think they ended up keeping the radio, and I, I never saw that good bottle of scotch the whole night. They hid that someplace. <laughs> they never and never came that, out for you to drink. No, and that's, the first, that, that's a, our first contact. And then how long did you know your wife before you married her? Three years. So with that, did, what year did you marry her? 1957. I met her in 1954. And uh, when you got married, where did you move to? Where was your first, uh, the first place? That Our you first in? place was on the Esplanade. It was about four buildings down from M Millie Rieras. It was an incredible place to start a marriage. And incidentally, I started my own business the same time I got married. And I set up the business in the house. And I had my drafting board up overlooking the ocean. And my wife was still working as a stewardess. So she'd go off to work and uh, I'd be there working. And as soon as the surf would come up, I'd go down and body surf. And she went to work one day and came back, and here I wasn't around, and I was in the ocean surfing. She wasn't too happy about that so, when I was supposed to be working. Now, did you live in a house or an apartment there? That was an apartment. And um, was it on the east or west side of the street? Well, it, it it was on the east side. There isn't anything on the west side there. Has there have there ever been houses while you lived in or uh, while you were in Redondo Beach? That there were houses or buildings on the west side of the Esplanade. Not there, no. Not while I, rem not that I remember. There was a, uh, there was a Riviera club down at the end of the Esplanade, actually in Torrance Beach, but it was half in Torrance and half in Redondo Beach, and that burned down while we were living there. I have some incredible pictures of that building burning down, by the way. And what was that? What again was that building? It was a it, it was a Riviera Club. I I don't. It's kind of a. They had a big pool and I don't remember what other facilities, restaurants and that sort of thing. And that was on the border. Riviera between? Beach Club. It was part in Manhattan or part in uh, Redondo and part in uh, Torrance. And was that actually on the beach? Uh, right on the beach. Yes. And do you know if that's how that area got the name Burnout? Could be. Could be. Could I, be. I had always heard that it was racing that got the name Burnout, but then I heard that it was when that club burned down. Could have been. That they called Could have been. Well, the, the the flames are going like a hundred feet in the air, and I, my wife's mother was staying with us. The living room was on the front, looking out over the ocean. The bedroom was in back. So, if she hadn't been there, we wouldn't have even known that was happening. But she woke up about two o'clock in the morning and saw the flames. Yeah, I got my camera, and I, we went down there and took pictures. It was got an incredible fire. What was, uh, did you ever go to the Riviera Club? Yeah. And what was it like? What was oh, there was a swimming pool there. Well, they used to have parties there for the, when I was in high school. It was yeah. a very nice club. So being an architect, what was the style of the, of the building? Uh, it was kind of Mediterranean, as I remember. And was it uh, like two-story? 
it was two or three story. It had it, it was had some uh, uh, level on the beach, and then a couple levels above that, maybe three levels and above it was a that. Private club. Yes. And well, the, it it changed hands a lot of times during that time, just like the athletic club did in Hermosa. Mm -hmm. And what was the swimming pool like? It was, a, it was, as I remember, it was inside the swimming pool. It was really nice. That would be unusual for its time. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you talked about beforehand were, uh, if we could go back to the Georges, who were the members of the George Club, and what did they eventually do uh, in Redondo Beach? Well, uh, we had numbers. Jim Koss was number one. He became a world-famous artist. Uh, he lived in Carmel, and he uh, he played golf. He belonged to the golf courses up there, and he played on Pebble Beach and Monterey Bay and Spyglass. He played golf every day and painted at night, so he had kind of the best of all worlds. And he'd sell his paintings for like fifty thousand dollars. He really was, and he uh, he sold paintings all over the world. He was he was uh, turned out very well. And I was number two, and Bill Busby was number three, who's probably most famous for being on the Redondo Beach School Board forever. He was a dentist in, in the Riviera also. And uh, number four was Jack O'Connor, who lived in Hermosa Beach. Uh, he was an engineer at, at Northrop. And number five was uh, Bill Perry, now, he had muscular dystrophy, and uh, he had a tough time getting around, but he became an accountant, and he was all of our accountants uh, up until the time he died prematurely. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we talked to you about is that your, your father was a city councilman and a police commissioner? Yes. Was that in Manhattan Beach? Manhattan yeah. Beach, yes. And is there anything about that that you remember? Did that cause some problems for you as a teenager, having the father on the police commission? Didn't cause any problems at all, but uh, I remember his his one comment about being councilman. They used to call him up at 2 o'clock in the morning screaming and yelling at him, and he always said, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And he, I think he only served one term, and he didn't want any part of it anymore. One of the things about the the Georges is that uh, you borrowed other people's cars. Do you remember what cars you borrowed and where you went with well, them? Well, we used our parents' cars. Uh, and <laughs> uh, Jim Koss, number one, father had a used car lot out on Pacific Coast Highway, and we used to take cars from that lot with his permission, of course. And where was that lot? What oh, fantastic. We had a big old Packard. <laughs> Red Packard with it, it was like an airplane. It had a front seat and then a, a cowling of about three feet and then a back seat with a windshield. And we used to drive that to school. And you drove that to Redondo? To Redondo High. <laughs> yeah. We were really the talk of the school in those days. And where was the where was the uh, used car lot or the It was on it was on uh, it was just about on Rosecrans and Pacific Coast Highway. And Eventually, I think some of you went to Long Beach Junior College? Yes, there were several of us that went to Long Beach Junior College. And In fact, was... we had uh, seven people playing on the football team. About four, four were starters. And was that the closest junior college at the time to Redondo Beach? Well, uh, no, I think Santa Monica was just as close. I was going to go to Santa Monica, but all of a sudden everybody else was going to Long Beach, so... I just went along with the crowd. And what was the drive like? How did you get there? Uh, uh, we'd, uh, we'd alternate borrowing our parents' cars. None of us had cars in those days. And we'd, we'd uh, borrow our parents' cars and uh, alternate days. What were the streets? How, what, what street did you take to get down there? Uh, there weren't any freeways then. Uh, I remember driving down Pacific Highway, and then we'd... Cut over on Del Amo. There were paved streets all the way, but no freeways. Now, were there? We've heard some stories about there being dairies and oil fields. Oh yeah, here all now. over the place. What yeah. was that like? If you could describe now some of the main streets, 
uh, that you would go through if you went to Long Beach today and what was there? When well, you there was a Beach? lot of open country and open fields and, and in fact, <laughs> uh, I have to tell an interesting story. We were coming home one day and Jim Koss was driving and he had, his, his eyesight wasn't too good. And uh, there was a big field out there that was a dead end part of the street. And they, they had a couple of red lights up there. And he just went right past the red lights and ended up in the field. And we said, what are you doing out here? He said, I thought those red lights were a taillight of a car. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up in the field. And uh, there were a lot of open fields and, and oil derricks and all that kind of thing. Well, I guess there still are in Long Beach and Signal Hill. Um, when you would leave Redondo Beach, were the borders the same or where did Redondo stop? I believe they were the same. And do you remember Clifton Heights? Oh, yeah. W what made that different uh, at the time? Well, it's where the red car ended. And it would, that's where Hollywood Riviera began. So the red car, its termination point was at, in Clifton Heights? Right. And were, was there a big turntable or something there? As I remember, yes. Did you mm -hmm. ever have any, uh, did you ever go there for any reason or? Uh, no, I never took the red car that way. In fact, I, I rode downtown with my father a few times on the red car. I, I don't know why, I never went south on the red car. Do you remember anything about the red car coming down Diamond Street and across Pacific Coast Highway at Diamond? Was there a line, maybe the green line or a line that... I don't across? remember that. The The red car, as far as I know, started in Clifton and went on service streets, and then at some point it ended up on that level just above the beach, a level between the strand and, and the beach level. And it came along there and then turned, and at some point it went on surface streets on into L.A. So I'd like to go back... Um, you talked about living on the Esplanade in 1957. How much did that apartment cost that was between Avenue H and Avenue I? It was no, it was it was south of Avenue I. It was down four buildings from uh, Millie Rieras, which was a fantastic restaurant even in those days, and uh, the rent was $120. And was that a lot of money? Yes. We didn't know how we were going to pay it, but it was such a fantastic apartment, we took it. And how many rooms did the apartment have? Well, it had a, a living room and a dining area and a kitchen and a, and a bath and a bedroom. It's just a one-bedroom apartment. And interestingly enough, that, uh, that building had six one-bedroom units and two two-bedroom units. And that building sold for $45,000 while we were living in it. Wow. And what year was that that it sold? Well, it would have, we lived there from 57 to 60, so it would have been sometime during that period. So while you were living there, when you went to Millie Rieras, what what do you remember most about Millie's of being a good restaurant? Well, mostly the seafood, of course. And we used to go a lot to uh, the Windjammer. Now, I've heard a lot about that. Oh, that's a fantastic, it. the only place you could, two o'clock in the morning, get a martini and, and pancakes. <laughs> Where was the Windjammer? It was on Avenue I and Catalina. And so Millie Rieras was on one corner. One corner, and yes. And Windjammer was, was on, up the on the opposite corner on Catalina. And was it a bar or was it a bar restaurant? and restaurant? Yeah, yeah. It was it, it was open most of the time. Yeah, I think it was open all night, as I remember, and the only time they closed was from about uh, 4 until 5 in the morning. When some people watch this, you know, they have no idea. Today they walk into a Denny's restaurant or yeah. something, and they have an idea of what a restaurant looks like, but they wouldn't know what the Windjammer was like. What was the... Well, this is a real bar restaurant type. It wasn't a restaurant like Denny's. It was more like, uh, more like the bullpen. It was a restaurant bar. And, and the, the food was, you, you could get any kind of food there. It was, it was terrific. Now, the bullpen is still in, it's on the it's still there. the border. Yes. And when did the bullpen come about? Well, let's see. The bullpen started as a hamburger place up by Redondo Union High School. And then it moved to Avenue I. 
And then it moved over to uh, Pacific Coast Highway. I think it was on the corner of Pacific Coast Highway and Palos Verdes. And then it moved to its present location. Which is between South Elena. Yeah, it's uh, in that triangle that, uh, there. That's actually in Torrance. Yes. That's right. You know, Redondo is on Alina Street, and then the, the shopping center where the bullpen is is actually in Torrance. So you told us the story about your wife coming home and catching you in the water instead of at the drawing board. Yeah, right. <laughs> your wife was a, uh, was a, she worked for the airlines? She was a stewardess, yes. For Western Airlines? Western Airlines, which has since merged with Delta. And so uh, I asked you the question if your wife was, if you, going to the house that night to the party, if you thought she was beautiful and you told me something about her. Yes, I said that she was uh, she was supposed to be the playgirl of the month. They wanted a stewardess to do that, and uh, she reneged on it because she was afraid she'd lose her job, and she really enjoyed uh, flying. She had a lot of fun and met a lot of interesting people. She used to fly to Las Vegas with all the movie stars, and she really enjoyed that. Now, as a young couple, did you spend a lot of time on the beach? Oh, yes. What kinds of things were uh, on the beach at the time? Were there things to do other than just to go down? Well, the swimming and body surfing and volleyball, yeah. And uh, one of the things that you talked about uh, prior was some of the theaters that were in Redondo and Manhattan. Do you remember the Strand Theater, and can you tell me where it was and what it was like? Well, the Fox Theater was the first and only theater for a long time, and the Strand Theater... I don't remember just when it was built, but it was on Catalina and uh, Torrance Boulevard. And then the Fox Theater, I believe it was Fox and Hermosa on about 13th Street and Hermosa Avenue. And then the Lamar Theater in Manhattan Beach was the last one of the beach theaters. And that was on... Uh, Center Street in Highland. And that's when we were very young because we were pleased to get a theater in our own town in Manhattan Beach. Right. At what? Uh, how long were you married before you had your first children? A year and a half. And uh, what hospital did you have to go to, to for the children to be born? It was Riviera Hospital. None of the big hospitals were here then. They didn't have Torrance Memorial or South Bay or Little Company of Mary. It was a little one-story building in Torrance, Riviera Hospital. And where was that in Torrance, do you remember? I don't remember exactly where, no. So did you bring the kids home to the to the apartment? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what was that like, having a baby in an apartment? It was great. We had a big yard there, and we put his playpen in the middle of the yard, and uh, he was great. And she'd take him to the beach every day. He was just tan as he could be. Now, you told us something that uh, in order for your wife to still fly, she couldn't tell them that she was married? No. And why was that? Well, because you couldn't fly if you were married, so she would lose her job if they knew she was married. So on the mailbox, we had Corwin Everting and Joan Keith below it. <laughs> and what did people think about? Did, now, did your neighbors know that you were married? Oh, yeah. They all knew we were married. But this sure. was in case Western Airlines came yes, to? Yes, yeah. Say. We just couldn't, you just couldn't be married and fly. And uh, how many children do you have? Two, and, boy and a girl. And what school did they go to for elementary school when they finally went to school? Uh, they went to, we lived in Palos Verdes at the time, and they went to Margate and uh, Point Vicente and Lenata Bay Grammar Schools, and then they both went to Palos Verdes High School. Now, did you ever move back to Redondo Beach after the apartment? Uh, we lived in the apartment for three years, and uh, one day the manager said, don't you think it's about time you moved to a house for having your little boy? <laughs> he was kind of hinting that and they didn't want the little kids around there anymore. And so we moved into a house, uh, rented a house in, in uh, Hollywood Riviera up on top there for a couple of years. And then we bought a house uh, out towards Marineland. 
uh, really nice house in a, in a development for thirty two thousand dollars. Now today, in two thousand five, most people wouldn't know what marine land was. Yeah, that's true. Can you? That's true. Well, it was, was. Uh, it was a water world, just like the the one in San Diego. Kind of like Sea World today. Sea World, exactly. And Only was, not to the magnitude of Sea World, but it, it was a fascinating place. And it was on Palos Verdes Drive West. Palos Verdes Drive West, out uh, past Hawthorne Boulevard. Yeah. And did you take right on the right on the top of the cliff? And did you take did you take your children there? Yes. What were the kinds of things that you could do there when you went? Oh, they had all kinds of food there, and they had the whales and the sharks and fish, and they had. Uh, several shows going on at once. It was it was a fabulous place. I was really sorry to see it go. One of the things that I've heard about you is that you've designed a lot of buildings in the harbor area here in Redondo Beach, and in particular things at the pier. What can you tell me about your projects there? Well, we designed what we call the pier approach, which is everything to the left of the pier as you walk onto the pier, which is nightclubs and food places and shops and restaurants at Tony's and uh, El Torito. And they had some nightclubs. Howard Rumsey had a, a nightclub down below. He's, he, nobody would probably remember him, but he's quite a famous jazz m musician that started in the lighthouse in Hermosa Beach. And he had, uh, he had his band down there and he called his place Neath the Sea, N-E-A-T-H, <laughs> the sea, and it was down underneath. And uh, it was very successful for a, a while, and then for some reason or other, he abandoned the, the idea. And then they had a nightclub there for a while, and then they had a uh, Chinese or Japanese restaurant in the first building. And for some reason, that second-story restaurant has never been successful. Now, have you, did you design any of those buildings, uh, the buildings on the pier? Yes, we designed all those buildings on the left-hand side. So what was there before those buildings? Nothing. So it was just an open There platform? was a seafood hacienda was on the beach, which is a fabulous restaurant, by the way. And then, uh, then the seafood hacienda was later built where the... Um, Blue Moon Saloon was, and it was still the Seafood Hacienda. So the Same Blue, owner. The Blue Moon Saloon was there until the storms in 1988. Yes. And then now it would be the equivalent of Samba in 2005. Samba, yes, yes. So when you, uh, where was the Seafood Hacienda? It was right on the beach. To, to, as you're walking onto the pier, it was right to the left of the pier and right on the beach, built right on the beach. And did it have uh, an outside patio? and? yeah. Yeah. So when you, what kind of food do they serve there? Uh, all kinds, seafood, steaks, whatever. It was an excellent restaurant. And why do you think that that went away? I have no idea. So We used to love to go there. It's a very popular place. So when you, before you built the buildings uh, where Howard Rumsey had mm -hmm. uh, concerts by the sea and uh, and neath the sea. Yes. And uh, El Torito's, was that just an open platform, the pier? Or no, no, it, was, the, it wasn't even there. We built the extension of the pier to do that, to okay. put those buildings on. And uh, now, do you remember anything about the George Freeth monument? Was that part of your plans, or did that get added? The man who started surfing for Henry Huntington? That, wasn't that there at the head of the pier? Yes. I, I re do remember that, but it's not there now. I don't know what happened to it. Now, did you build Tony's? Yes. And what do you remember? Did you build it for Tony Trucci? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, we did. That was the only tenant that we actually built a building for. The rest, the rest leased it later. And what year did you, do you remember what year you built Tony's? Uh, the drawings say 71, so it was built right after that, so probably 72. But an interesting note on that pier is... We had a structural engineer, of course, and uh, he wanted to put the pilings at 10 feet on center each way, and we agreed. We thought that was an excellent idea, so we did that, and everybody laughed at us. They thought we were spending too much money, and it wasn't right, and we were crazy to do that. And 
As it turned out, we weathered every storm that ever hit there, and there was no damage except a few bo broken windows ever to that, any of those buildings. So, any so we did the right thing. <laughs> so in other words, uh, today, uh, when they had the fire after the storm, really the only surviving part is are those buildings that you built. Yes. How did you come up with the design for the round portion of Tony's? Was that your design of old Tony's? Oh, I didn't do old Tony's. So you did new no, Tony's? No, new Tony's. I had nothing to do with old Tony's. I did not do that building. So you did New Tony's and El Torito? And El Torito and all those buildings on the left-hand side of the pier, yeah. Now, did you build anything out on the pier as well? We did a restaurant, I believe it was in about that same time. Uh, Gordon McRae had the pier, he was a lessee on the pier, and what turned out to be Redondo Beach Marina, Boat Basin 3, and then Ralph Moore had the, the Horseshoe Pier, he was a lessee for that. And we did a restaurant for him called the Golden Hull, which was on the north leg of the pier. And it later became Cattleman's. So it was at the, actually at the base of the north side of the pier. Yes. Where it reconnected to the right. land. Right, yeah. And uh, they, in 88, they had a storm in January and a fire in February, <laughs> another storm. <laughs> in April, and, and that did that whole end of the pier in, and all those buildings on the pier were gone. Now, um, going back, as an architect, did you take any notice of the harbor? I, I think that the Army Corps of Engineers has built, had built the harbor over a number of years. Uh, starting in 1939, what do you remember about what made the harbor? 39, they did, they built the first part of the breakwater, which was much lower, but I think it had the same uh, plan that they have today. It was just much lower. And then they abandoned that when the war started. So they started laying rock for the breakwater in 1939? I think they finished it in 39. And do you know where the rock came from? or? I have no idea, no. So uh, what changes did that bring about in Redondo Beach, uh, in the beach, say the beach part, after they built the break wall, was there a change in the beach? Oh, definitely. There were there were a lot of beach houses along uh, Harbor Drive. I don't think they called it Harbor Drive at the time, but uh, along that area, which would be on the on the eastern side of the breakwater, and they would get washed out all the time with the big waves before they put the breakwater. So do you remember a downtown in Redondo Beach? Oh, yes. What was the downtown like? Yeah, well, they had the Redondo Beach Hotel was there, and uh, it was it was uh, really something. And then they had the, uh, oh, I can't remember. The, no, it was the Elja Arms. The Redondo Beach Hotel was up on, on the hill. Uh, and then they had the the boats going out to the gambling and the restaurants and the uh, and the games and all that sort of thing. It was kind of a Coney Island type atmosphere, and of course they had office buildings and gas stations and that kind of thing down there. What was the Elja Arms like? That's an unusual name. Did you uh, ever have any? Did you ever go there? Or no, I I never went there. Um, I've, we've heard a lot about roller skating in Redondo Beach. What do you remember about that? Well, they had a roller skating rink down there. We used to go roller skating there. And this was near the pier? Yes. And what year did you go roller skating there? Well, when we were kids. I don't remember specifically what year. Um, today, kids have these inline skates. Yeah. What, what were the skates like then? Oh, they're just your typical front rollers and back rollers with four wheels. And uh, What were the, the wheels made of? Uh, steel. So, and were they thick? About how thick were they? Very thick. And was it easier? They, they were about, <laughs> they were like, yeah, it was a lot easier to skate on those. And inline is more like ice skating. Okay. And do you remember anything about wrestling? We heard about uh, a wrestling uh, venue down near the roller skating rink. I didn't know about that. No, I didn't know about that. Um, do you remember anything about the after the plunge? What year did they take down the plunge? Do you remember? 
And was it replaced with anything? I remember that we went to the plunge when we were pretty young. And I, it seems to me that, uh, well, maybe by the time I got to high school, it was still there because the swimming team used to work out there. And that would have been in the 30s and 40s. And I think not too long after that, it just sort of disappeared. Now, and I don't know for what reason. Do you remember anything about uh, today in a 2005, there's the Seaside Lagoon. Uh, I know that that's been there at least since the 50s. Do you remember anything about that? Uh, it's the... Oh, no, that one. The Seaside Lagoon went in in the early 60s. We designed some buildings around that lagoon that never got built. We designed a dance pavilion out over the ocean and uh, some bathhouses and some restaurants around there. And fortunately, the lessee went broke. Tito Donato was his name. So, yeah, I've never heard of Tito. So, Tito Donato, what did he own? Well, he had a restaurant. Uh, gosh, I'm not sure. He was a good friend of uh, a lot of the city fathers here. So, they got him in on a lease to develop that. And he had a very good restaurant. Uh, I'm not sure where it was. I never went there. And uh, he just couldn't get the money together to build any of that. There's a lot of a lot of things happened in the harbor in those days where uh, money was kind of hard to get on leased land. They're not as sophisticated lenders as they are today. Now, we talked to Bob Maestrell from Body Glove, mm -hmm. and he talked about having six buildings there in where Gordon McRae's uh, leasehold was on the across from the current Crown Plaza and um, the Gold's Gym that's there in 2009. Uh -huh. Now, were, would that be the same area where Tito Donato was going to have his? No, his uh, that was around the right around the swimming lagoon where okay. where Tito Donato he had the lease on the swimming lagoon and all the land around it. Now, do you still have the plans? Yeah, for these places. Mm -hmm. Now, what what have you thought about uh, Heart of the City, and how would that have? How is that compared to what you wanted to do in 1960, in the early 60s? Well, it was totally to different because we had a big dance pavilion and I didn't see anything like that in the heart of the city plans out over the water. And we had a couple of restaurants in there and uh, uh, some pretty, pretty wild bathhouses with pretty, pretty original design. And unfortunately, they were never built. So the, the word bathhouse in 2005, I think, doesn't have the same... No, no, not at all. So it was a, let, Let's just say it was a locker room, more like, to change your clothes to go to the swimming lagoon. Okay. It wasn't a true bathhouse. That, that's a, that's a myth, misnomer. So what can you tell us about... One of the things you talked about was uh, building... Uh, I've heard that you're responsible for the pier parking structure. Yes. Can you tell me anything about how you decided to build that and who uh, in the city was at the, the base uh, or the foundation of building that? that wanted well, to it wasn't my decision to build it. It was the city's. And uh, Victor Gruen designed it, and then we did the, the drawings and the structure for it. I had a structural engineer, John Martin. And that's the pier parking structure that goes under the pier, the base of the pier now. And or with, Did you also design plaza parking at the other end? That's the other end. That's this end. Okay. So you're the one, you designed the structure at Torrance, uh, yes. Torrance Boulevard. Um, are there any other buildings that you did, that you built there in the Pier area? Well, uh, yes. The, the office building for Redondo Beach Marina, which also has the Happy Clam, or now it's, uh, what is that name? I think it might be the Happy this, Clam again. It no, 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 it's and... not the Happy Clam. It's this. Delzano. Delzano. By the sea. Yeah, which is very good, by the way. I like that restaurant. Very good. Um, one of... Oh, and we did the uh, the little, uh, I don't want to say bathhouse, locker room and office at the at the lagoon for the city. You, uh, one of the things that was were in the notes that we read is that you played a part in the expansion of City Hall. Yes. What uh, today we know it that it's in a U shape in 2005. Right. And when you uh, can you tell us when? And I think this I was, was this was the east wing of, of of the City Hall. And the so 
was originally they're just a north wing, and then the two east and the west foots were our feet. I guess were. Uh, yeah, right. That that's the east wing that runs uh, runs north and south, and attaches to the original city hall. Now, do you remember the old city hall in downtown? Yes, I do. What was that like? And oh, was it, it was sort of a gothic structure. I I don't remember exactly what street it was on. It was on a hill. I know that. And uh, God, that was a long time ago. It, it was a true gothic structure, stone and and a very high pitched roof. Um, something you belong to for many years are the Chamber of Commerce and the Rotary. Um, what can you tell me about the Chamber of Commerce? Well, I joined the Chamber of Commerce and the JCs in 1957, and I was in a. Of course, you have to leave the JCs when you're 35, which I did, and then I was in the chamber, and uh, I'm not anymore. But I was in there for 30. I got a 37-year plaque <laughs> a few years ago, and uh, I was president in '64. And I believe I was president of the JCs in 1957, if I'm not mistaken. And what was the importance of those those organizations in 1957? Do you think that you brought more businesses here? And oh yes, what are very you most definitely. proud of as the president and the things that you did? Well, I think uh, on the JCs we did a lot of programs for the kids, different events and fishing derbies and that kind of thing, and uh, that was very worthwhile. Uh, it's hard getting everybody out to monitor those, but we did. And uh, Chamber of Commerce was very effective in those days. I think they brought a lot of business to the city. Now, do you, was there ever a uh, some kind of a uh, a sea festival that you sponsored? Uh, we heard something about a, that there used to be a king and queen of the beach or something like that. Was that a Chamber of Commerce or that might have been another? I don't remember that. To be honest with you, you, I just don't remember. You talked about the fishing derbies. What were those like? Oh, there we had them in the in the uh, boat basin three with the kids, and they were pretty good. And we had different events like track meets and games and that sort of things for the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that I know that you're very involved in is the yacht club. Yes. What are the changes for the boating public, and uh, in Redondo Beach? And how long have you had a boat in Redondo Beach? Well, we had an Ericsson 30 for 28 years, and they say that the happiest days in your life was when you buy a boat and the day you sell it. But I regretted selling it ever since. But we did have it for 28 years, and we really enjoyed the boating. Now, what year do you think you got your first boat, or the first time you got the boat? Uh, was 1968. And what year they built the breakwater or started? Uh, the first phase of it in 1939. Yes. Um, I, well, 1960, early 60 was when they started putting in the landfill and all that. And I think 62 was when they leased, started leasing it out to the, the, to the various uh, lessees. And how did, do you have any idea how they came up with the names King Harbor and Port Royal? Well, the overall King Harbor was named after Congressman King. And I, the, the overall King Harbor is broken down into Port Royal and Portofino and King Harbor, which is a little confusing because the name of the whole thing is King Harbor. And then there's the King Harbor Marina within King Harbor. Now, Congressman King, was he uh, a member of the House of Representatives? Yes. And was he instrumental in getting the harbor, parts of the harbor to be built, or do you know why they named it after him? I'm sure he was. And how, how has it changed through the years of boating, of boating there, of having a boat there? Well, the boat, boats have gotten a lot bigger, that's for sure, <laughs> because uh, I have a marina client. That, well, his last marina was down in... Uh, in Cabo San Lucas, and his smallest slip was 40 feet. So uh, the, the, it's definitely bigger and better. 
And the boating, as far as going to Catalina and traveling around the Ensenada race and all that, is pretty much the same over the years. Now, it said in our pre-interview that you joined the Yacht Club in 1967? Yes. Now, how did the Yacht Club come about as you, was that new then, or had it been around for a while? Uh, I believe it was completed in 1964. And I actually joined the Yacht Club, well, I had several boats. I had a Sabbath and a, a little dinghy, and a, I had an interest in a power boat. I had four boats at one time, <laughs> or parts of four boats. And actually, I uh, joined the yacht club before we bought our boat. And on the power boat, did you ever go water skiing out outside the break wall? Oh, well, we didn't with that boat. I used to go water skiing all the time. We 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 water skied in the harbor. When after they put the landfill in, before they gave out the the leases, we water skied in the harbor all the time. It was nice and smooth like glass. It was a beautiful place to ski. And then they decided that we couldn't ski there anymore, whoever decided that we couldn't do that. So then, then we just skied in the ocean. You know, if you get there early in the morning, water skiing in the ocean is beautiful. And you go up and over the waves, and it's... Uh, it went <laughs> one time we were skiing, and uh, Bud Marisu, who was a city councilman here at one time, he was one of our water skiing buddies, we were skiing along, and he was skiing at the time, and we saw a shark fin following him. <laughs> and uh, we just went along our way and everything, and we finally got him back in the boat, and we told him afterwards that there was a shark fin after him. <laughs> and he said, so why didn't you tell me? We said, God, if we'd have told you, you'd have panicked and probably fell off your ski and be eaten alive. <laughs> Now, did you ever uh, get involved in fishing in Redondo Beach? No, I never did. I, for some reason, I just don't like to fish. It's funny because it's there. It's a wonderful place to fish, but I just never never much liked to fish. Or I don't know why. Now, I've seen pictures of, uh, actually saw a picture of uh, a killer whale off of Redondo at mm -hmm. one time. Do you ever remember going out on your boat and seeing whales and things? Oh, like we that? saw whales, yeah, but never any killer whales. We used to go out and see... Uh, whales and porpoises. One time we were sailing to Catalina in in a November in the in the fall, and I must have seen ten thousand porpoises. They were just all over the place, and they'd swim along beside our boat and swim in front of it, and then turn over on their backs and look up at us. And then another group was just like a squadron of airplanes. And then everywhere you look, there'd be there'd be porpoises jumping out of the water. And you remember about what year that was? Uh, probably in the 70s. I never saw so many porpoises in my life. Because I think now in 2005, people, that would really be something today, too. And you would never see that many. I, it, uh, the conditions must have been just right. Of course, we see porpoises from our apartment all the time. Okay, so we have about a minute to go, and then we're going to okay. be done with this one. All right. Um, is there anything else that you remember? I'm looking at your your representative clients. Uh, it looks like you've built a number of things. Is there